Welcome back to the DSR Ghostwriting Podcast containing thus far technical tips for uh, freelancers and small business owners and I'm pleased to announce that the content is going to be taking a pivot, a pivot for the better I hope. It's always been my intention to actually discuss the subject of ghostwriting uh, but particularly information for people that are thinking about working with a ghostwriter um, that might be curious about what works, what doesn't, what we can do, what kind of projects we can't do, um, and just other miscellaneous facets, because I I appreciate that from the other side of the market, it might be kind of a perplexing process. It's very easy to become uh, accustomed to things like receiving briefs and producing various forms of writing for clients and to think that's very everyday. But now, and again, people tell me we've never worked with a ghostwriter and it sounds scary. So there's going to be more of that nature. I, I am also very passionate about helping, you know, writers and freelance writers in any way I can. I absolutely would not like to hold myself out as an expert. Um, I have been writing for about the best part of 10 years, uh, but the freelancing aspect and this is being very hypocritical because I've mentioned a few times online that I generally try to not use that word uh and content these are my the, the, these are my two bet noirs i believe the french word is um the things that get my good at because i think freelancing just as a word tends to devalue what we do i see myself as a small business small business owner personally um and i encourage other freelancers to uh, take that step um whether or not they're working with people at the end of the day if it's your full-time gig Um, and you're doing stuff like sales prospecting and business development and managing clients, all that stuff besides doing the work, uh, building your website, putting on analytics, being your kind of, uh, I've made the point on Medium that I described a typical day, this is I believe my first Medium post, typical day in the life of a freelance writer because people might be curious whether if you work at home or in an office, what what are you actually doing? Are you writing articles the entire day? I know a lot of freelancers, including including myself, and again, being hypocr- being hypocritical and using this term simply as a shorthand for a small business owner, um, a lot of freelancers would work horrible hours. I'm currently at that stage, not endorsing it or recommending it. I've just literally consumed coffee out of a cocktail shaker. If you want more bizarre content, go on Medium, and uh, I figured out that raw coffee grounds contain twice the caffeine of uh coffee brewed and I should probably get my cholesterol checked um where were we the hours so yeah it's it's just there's a few hours of writing a course in every day as a matter of course I'm currently have a brief in front of me sitting down in front of google drive but I'm interrupting my day to do a podcast why am I doing a podcast is it for your benefit dear listener it is I enjoy getting information out uh to the extent I have information to get out I by no means have ever I hope held myself out as some kind of an expert because as I mentioned I've been doing writing related tasks for 10 years not all of that has been freelancing related uh that actually kicked off accidentally um at least the ghostwriting did um I'll give you I'll give I'll include my ghostwriting journey in brief in this thing so um I was writing for a number of years I kind of kicked off when I was in law school believe it or not once upon a time I was studying law and I always loved writing I remember being like a kid and typing up something I called the Daniel Times, which is like this family publication on, you know, this is way back when you had these, uh, those, you know, CRT monitors and those printers. And that gave me great, great pleasure, the creative process and putting it out. I'm sure it was nonsensical as a lot of my online writing still is. So nothing much has changed, but I did that and uh, found it years later, you know, when I was like in college already and I kind of, it astounded me that I'd been interested in writing for such a long time. Um, I used to, I used to also draw in the pre-computer age, actually handwrite uh, news editions on this paper, uh, and I found those as well. And I was like, "Wow, this has been something that's with me since I'm a kid." Um, and kind of a digital, digital native. And I know that phrase gets thrown around, but it's really true for me. I don't really feel, um, you know, next to my bed, I have my Kindle. I have a few paper, but I always like to buy certain books in paper formats still, but I don't really draw a hard distinction between information I glean from a book, from the internet, from a Quora thread, from a Reddit thread, from a Facebook thread. To me, it's all the same. Um, Like, you know, some people kind of have the perception that 
maybe online stuff or if it's only if it's only in an online website it's not as valid or whatever but personally i've never really had that uh, assumption coming into it um yes five minutes recorded and it's already managed to be completely meandering and without any direction so another show edition will be layouts those are coming soon too but yeah let's let's talk a little bit about ghostwriting so um and picking up this story so when i came to to israel i was working briefly i uh, did this news website in college let's fast forward again um set up a university news website there wasn't one at my university thought it would be a good idea to have one ran this new site for a couple of years uh actually four years to be exact quite a long time um in the last year did a business incubation thing at my university then the first year of college i interned at irish central which is irishcentral.com Irish America's leading news source. That is not a pitch, uh, but great experience under the tutelage of uh, Neil O'Dowd, who is the publisher and founder of very uh, well-respected, well-known um, Irish American journalist. Uh, terrific, terrific experience. And I really mean that because people tend to use and abuse interns. I've seen it happen. It's ugly. Um, definitely Irish Central was not like that at all. Neil, Neil went out of his way to make me feel welcome and uh he introduced me to his family and put me down to went down to orlando to cover an irish dancing event went up to the yonkers quite a fascinating experience actually uh observing irish america um as anyone who's anyone from ireland who's mixed in that world can tell you it's a very uh uh interesting community sometimes it's a lot more hardline beliefs than actual uh native born Irish people but um so that got me into writing and I was kind of hoping to veer towards the journalism direction study journalism in London as a master's degree after my initial law degree and did a little bit as I said I was writing for Irish Central for a few years remotely um a few articles of which went into their print edition as well the Irish voice um came over here to Israel after working in a company in Cork V Connecta slash e canvasser um, and that job was managing marketing communication. So it was kind of going again into the communications side of things. Um, came over here to Israel. Um, I actually technically did a few months of journalism, uh, working at the Jerusalem Post my first summer here. It was really a part-time gig. And with all in the world to the J Post, uh, it was just not financially viable. I was very transparent about that uh, to continue working there, um, by which I mean that I'm not sure that um i could really have paid the roof over my head uh with what i was being paid to be a copy editor and i i know that might be in perhaps in bad taste to put that into the public domain it trust me it's not a it's the openest of open secrets but it, it's a, it's a tragedy just because of you know the way journalism has gone and that uh, these news organizations are just not making revenue i was also offered a job at arts that summer believe it or not and it was the same. I just said, this is not financially feasible to live in Tel Aviv on these salaries. So as much as I still feel enormously passionate about journalism and think that journalism does tremendous work, it's assailed unjustly in Israel under um, Benjamin Netanyahu, who, who has imported the crude anti-media, anti-democratic sentiment of President Trump. And again, I don't want to interject too much politics here, but I think it's very, very negative when you see BB campaigning saying the lying media, the fake media, the fake news, uh, it's ugly. Uh, very, very vital to the Jewish uh, tradition of discourse to have open discussions and the media plays uh, an enormously import important role in facilitating that. And thankfully, Israel is really just about the only uh, country in the Middle East with a free and open press. And long, long may that continue and long may those critical articles against BB's regime keep being published in arts because someone's gonna someone has to publish them arts for ha, arts for those that don't know is a left-leaning uh technically i believe it's actually the israeli paper of record um so anyway so i started doing, doing that then went down uh, the kind of back down the communications road uh worked at a pr company for a period and then did marcom again at another uh tech company called ayaka they're an iot company and by this stage, it was, I just kind of felt the door was closed on writing. Um, but I also took on uh, projects um, very early in the day, actually. You, you open a file here and it's fairly straightforward from a tax and reporting standpoint uh, to do that. So I basically said there's no risk. 
And I noticed that people were looking for freelance writers left, right, and center um, when I was on Facebook. So I just started doing gigs, basically. And I was like, can you write an article? And I guess because I've been writing for years, I was like, yeah, sure, I can write an article. And, you know, I would see it published under the CTO's name. And I, I, I really couldn't care less. I mean, that's, that's the truth about ghostwriting. I, I kind of try to answer a couple of questions here. And honestly, um, I just couldn't care less. Like people, I, I hate to be so like frivolous about it, but people say, how can you do ghostwriting? That's terrible. You see your stuff as other people's names. All right. I'm, that's totally cool with me. Um, that's basically the short of what I, what I have to say about it. Uh, you know, people get into, it's not a great job. If you have an ego, of course, that goes without saying, if you have an ego and you need everything you write to be published under your name, this is potentially the worst line of business you could possibly be in. So do yourself a favor and do something else such as writing. Um, so let me go into, into ghostwriting. Exactly. And as I said, it kind of got into it this way and it just snowballed, uh, to the extent that I was able to leave a full-time full time in-house position in order to do this. Uh, and I've been doing it full-time for approximately a year and a half now. Uh, as far as I know, my family have no clue what, I, what it is that I actually do. They'd probably be mystified by it, which is part of the reason I wrote this article, to try to demystify. And as I just said, you're not being screwed over when your name does not get published on a piece, which for some reason seems to be some people's assumption. They're like, oh God, you're being taken advantage of. How do you stand for that? No. Not at all. Um, so let me start from the top. I have my medium post in front of me here. That's my furious, uh, I type in a very furious manner. Um, okay, so what is ghostwriting? So I've offered a very top level definition of ghostwriting being anything you write that does not have your name on the byline. So the byline, it literally means by plus line equals byline. That's when you see an article and it says by Daniel Rosell, by whatever. So technically anything. Now I go on LinkedIn and I add ghostwriters to ingratiate myself into the ghostwriting community. And I see people saying social media ghostwriter. Now that's where I personally draw the line. Um, as I said in the post, if you take that definition, when I was working in Ayaka and writing social media posts for Ayaka, published on LinkedIn, Facebook, or, or any company for that matter, just using an example here, that is ghostwriting. It doesn't say by Daniel Rosal. In fact, I will often write, I would often write quotes for people in the company, such as my boss, and that's ghostwriting. But is ghostwriting a sentence really ghostwriting? I wouldn't personally consider it so. Other people will disagree with me. The point I'm trying to make here is that it's really a flexible definition. Uh, I'm not saying I'm right or that they're right. That's just my definition. Now, another one, that was point one. Another one that's a bit trickier is uh, stuff like white papers. So white papers are kind of these longer, deeper dives, and I hate to sink into the world of business jargon, but, um, you know, kind of deep technical anal analyses, plural of analysis, yes. Uh, and, and sometimes I have trouble pronouncing, pronouncing words, oddly enough. I'm, stumb I'm stumbling on this one. So these are these longer, deeper dives into complex technical topics, very frequently used in B2B selling cycles to justify big ticket purchasing decisions. What that means is that you would have a you know large enterprise typically looking to buy, for example, I'm currently writing about point of sale finance providers. You have point of sale systems and sometimes you'll see them offering financing options and under the, under the hood, to make that work is a little bit complicated. You have financing providers who work with the various POS providers to offer financing solutions to the customer. Now, this isn't the piece I'm writing, but I could conceivably write a white paper for on behalf of one of these POS financing providers going into the nitty gritty about exactly what's offered and how is implementation and what can we, what POS software uh, slash, slash firmware can we integrate with going into great detail and those are white papers basically now they're more expensive and why would someone buy a white paper because if you're if you're working for this pos company and you do a terrific job at the white paper and you land a contract with the financing sorry i'm I, the other way around uh with the pos software provider that could bring in tons and tons of revenue it could be a huge deal it could be a six-figure deal so that's what white papers and are and as i said they're very typically used in b2b not exclusively so 
um, but that would be their association. So if I write a white paper, let's take that one for the fictitious POS company. It's not typically attributed to a person. I have seen white papers that are, but it's the exception rather than the norm. So is that ghostwriting? I'm writing something, it doesn't have my name in it for sure. It probably just has a company's name in it. It might say by the big company X research department. Um, I personally think it is. I have on dsrghostwriting.com. My website, white papers are one of the things I do. Um, speeches as well, which I certainly think are ghostwriting. And you never hear, uh, typically don't hear, I should say, speech writers refer to themselves as ghostwriters. But I can't understand why that is. Because if you're writing a speech for someone and they're speaking it and no one knows about the speech writer, to me, that's just a form of ghostwriting. Um so that's white papers. Now, there's another point I make in the definition aspect of this. Um, that is that sometimes ghostwriting means ghostwriting books. So ghostwriters write books um, almost exclusively. I'm sure you'll find ones that do not offer that as a service or have never done so. Some You have classical ghostwriters, and there's a well-known British ghostwriter called Andrew Crofts. He's written a well-known book to ghostwriting, which is one of the physical books I... Uh, ordered because I think it's very good to have that guide. Interesting book, uh, recommend it. Um, and he just, he, he, you know, in that book, there's no mention of white papers, articles, blogs, it, for a lot of ghostwriting, and this is in the publishing world. So ghostwriters for books are basically for contract writers, just as they are if you're writing an article, and the ghostwriter um, will be paid a contract to write the book. Um, sometimes, and I'll talk about attribution later, sometimes this is a pure 100% ghostwriting. Sometimes it's what I would call partial ghostwriting. The typical phraseology used is with or by ghostwriter. Um, but that's it, and they get paid a contract. IP, intellectual property, everything, copyright, goes over to the author. The author is a person who commissions the job. And that person then brings that to a publisher or publishes it themselves, self-publishing. But that's your involvement as a ghostwriter. There's typically no royalties coming back from the book. It's purely a contract writing job, just a bigger contract writing job than writing an article for obvious reasons. The word counts a lot bigger. So some people look at ghostwriting only in those terms. The point I made in this blog is that the lines are kind of blurry. So <laughs> let's take an ebook um, that I just finished working on. It's going to be published in KDP, Kindle Direct Publishing. Uh, it's very, very easy to publish a paperback and very easy in theory. There's little nuances of the cover art needs to be good and you need to work with a ideally someone's experienced in formatting for print and formatting for Kindle, you know, to get your manuscript into a format that's going to look great on a Kindle or look great in a book format. So there's people who do just that. They're external service providers and literally... All they do is take, and I, I don't mean that in deprecating by any means at all, but this is literally, the, that's their service offering. They will get a great cover design with a graphics designer, format it excellently, typography, formatting the lot, and hand you back your stuff, and you can self-publish or bring it to a publisher. To be honest, if you bring it to a publisher, a publisher's boss, your, the rights to your book through directly through a literary agent, they're going to handle all that stuff. <clears throat> so more typically, this would be for people who are, going down the self-publishing route, but want someone to make it look really good. Sorry, this is kind of a sidetrack, but so this is basically one conception of ghostwriting. And as I said, in today's, so my point was really, if I write an ebook of 70 pages paperback, and then the person decides they're going to roll out a paperback on KDP, because why not? I've just written a book. To me, 70 pages is kind of short to call that a book, but the lines are blurry. So... I think because the lines are blurry, uh, ghostwriters today and in general are working on a lot of different types of projects. I'm sure people, people like Andrew Crofts are out there. I, I would uh, submit that they are the exception rather than the norm because he's a very established book ghostwriter. If you're a very established book, book ghostwriter and Andrew has said in articles that his fees range between 100, Andrew Croft. I've never met the guy. I have a weird thing. I don't like calling people by their first name if I've never met them that feels ingenuine to me so I don't know the guy would be nice to meet him one day Andrew Croft says his fee for writing a book is 100 to 150 thousand pounds sterling so why would he take on an article for 400 quid 
just wouldn't make any sense financially. Um, articles are like messy projects. They're short. You have to do a lot of them for a lot of different clients, juggling work. You know, it wouldn't make sense. But as I said, I think the people coming up through the ranks at the formative years of their ghostwriting trajectory are going to find themselves, at least this is what I find myself, taking on miscellaneous projects ranging from books to speeches to white papers to ebooks. I think it's part of the fun. Other people could say that's scattered. One, I have a list of what I don't do and uh, <clears throat> in case you have been so inspired by this explanation to say he is the writer for, for, for me or for us, uh, I will tell you now, <laughs> social media and uh, small stuff like micro copier projects, copywriting projects or stuff specifically that I do not do. Um, but the rest of the stuff, yes. Um, <clears throat> okay, so next question is, who uses ghostwriters? And I sometimes get asked, how many medium posts, how many articles, how much of all this torrent of content, and again, I don't like the word content, let's call it writing, how much of this torrent of writing we're seeing on a daily basis is being ghostwritten and how much is being written. And as I said in the post, I don't believe anyone has this figure. How would you get that figure? And why would people, you know, you, you could in theory conduct a market research survey. This may be out there. I may be embarrassing myself by saying it doesn't exist. I've never seen the figure. Listeners are always welcome to correct me. Just simply uh, drop me an email and uh, say, you're an idiot. This is a link to the survey, you fool. And that's totally fine. And uh, I would be happy to issue a correction because the most important thing for me is to get good, um, good information, accurate information out there. Uh, so as I said, I, I don't think there's a figure um, and I doubt that it would be possible to get one because why would people tell a random market research person that, oh, you know what, all these medium post I'm actually having ghostwritten um but what I did say is an awful lot why did I say it's an awful lot because there's a lot of people producing ghostwritten work not just ghostwriters PR agencies content marketing agencies um personal assistants and uh long-suffering spouses friends and family members these are all people that informally or formally could find themselves engaged in the process of ghostwriting on behalf of an author credibly uh so that's a lot of different people um, you could have a mixture of in-house and out-of-house resources, or you could have a content manager assisted, ably assisted by an external PR firm, in turn, ably assisted by someone like me. Um, also something that happens, but realistically, an awful, awful lot of these LinkedIn posts you are seeing are not actually written by the person, a huge amount, because there's so many different people to turn to for ghostwriting. Um, and as you said, sometimes it's blatantly obvious. You'll you'll go to a conference and you'll see a non English speaker, a second a second language English speaker. And I live in Israel, so I'm kind of thinking of Israelis here. I must admit, you'll have them sort of fumbling for words, and then they come out with this crazy, well written article, <coughs> a project I must say I've been involved in a few times, and it's just kind of obvious. You could watch a YouTube video, look at the guy, and be like, he obviously didn't write this. So sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's less obvious. But I, I, and this is this leads me in nicely to is ghostwriting ethical. I say I don't think it really matters to be honest. The way I look at ghostwriting, and let's throw in some more businessy jargon while we're at it. It's a symbiotic relationship. There is symbiosis. There is you're taking someone like me. I am a writer. Uh, I write about technology. I know quite a bit about certain bits of technology, <laughs> including Linux and cloud computing. But naturally, I don't have the knowledge of a cloud engineer or a system engineer or a CTO, not even close. So I'm, I have a knowledge gap in order to write. CTO and systems engineer, because I worked with a lot of these people, I know they don't like writing particularly. They hate writing, actually. I'm not saying they look down on writing. Some of them might, but they don't want to write. It's annoying. They have other things to do. They're, they're, they love technology pure and simple. So they will turn to someone like me. They have all the knowledge. I just need to talk to them. And that's why I think briefs and subject matter experts are such vital things uh, not to skimp on, you know, and you need to, if you're in the business of freelancing ghostwriting, you need to build these things into your hourly. People say, should you charge for phone calls, not charge for phone calls. If you're having two, three hour long phone calls repetitively, I think you have to factor that into your compensation structure. You have no choice. Otherwise you're going to, you're going to find yourself running out of hours in the day and not being able to you know make your financial targets you have to and <laughs> sometimes i explain that to clients it's not greed 
I'm not like you. I'm not sitting in a business as a salaried employee with a fixed salary and have to be there for hours. So anyway, that's just what I'm saying for the white to symbiotic relationship. You get these two people, you pair them up and the guy takes that knowledge locked into the CTO's brain. And he's thinking of all technical terms and he puts it into something intelligible. As a result, good information gets out to the world, which in turn benefits humanity perhaps that's being a bit too effusive with it but i so i think that's a good thing ghost ring is also very very old andrew crafts again in his book i believe uh says that that if you look at ancient rome you had these people called scribes uh who were kind of like part of the nobility so what a ter- what a, what's gone wrong with the world what's gone wrong with the world that uh the freelance writing marketplace has gotten to such a stage that the <clears throat> the once noble ones of the world such as myself have become the downtrodden um but no i'll i'll try all these all these weird asides with jokes essentially maybe my humor will come through so my so may not find it humorous so it's a very ancient practice been going on for a long time as you said he has scribes ancient rome now you have ghost writers so it's not a new thing and as i said i really think it adds value to by pairing up these two people okay let's jump on because i want to keep this under 30 minutes is ghost writing fair to the reader another ethical question I don't think it's worth even getting into. I don't think they care. He says you don't care. I don't think they care. I don't really care if I read a book. Did did, did the person write this? Did someone? Did he hire a ghostwriter? I don't know. Is it is is a good re- Is it worth my while to read this? I don't care who wrote it. Um, is ghostwriting fair to the ghostwriter? Now this is interesting because this I must admit I'm drawing upon the brief I attempted once to send a white paper to <clears throat> family members to be transparent, to be open, to share. I said, this is great. Look at this. It's a, a international big company that they, they know about. And I said, this is, look at this beautifully designed white paper. They did a fantastic job. Great graphics. And I said, I wrote this. Can you believe I wrote this? Almost everything. They edited tiny bits and pieces, but give or take. And they said, but your, 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 your name's missing. And I said, yeah, I know my name's missing. My name would never be on a white paper. But they were like horrified. And I think they think I'm getting screwed over. So <clears throat> as I said, uh, this can be a conception. So let me just try explain. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so people might say this is not a choice and they think you've been pressured. As I said, um, here's here's a point I, I would like to make, right? A lot of ghostwriters are former journalists. Um, I don't really consider for my brief stint that I'm a journalist, even though I have a degree in it, whatever. Um, but certainly that was kind of my general trajectory into this. Um, but it, it really is something pretty established. There's also, and as I said here, it's there's nothing saying you have to be exclusively a ghostwriter, right? Now I'm writing currently, as I said, eBooks and some books for people. And I think that's a great way for me to dip into the market and then maybe to you know work on one of these projects under my own name. I have a few books ideas I'm working upon. Others would tell you that no, you, you, you yourself need to be a seasoned book writer in order to even propose to write a book for somebody else uh, that's a differing opinion i want to put it out there because as you said there are some points of uh differing opinions in this whole world and that's uh totally fine um what is ghostwriting not so let me just conclude with with this um ghostwriting is not really i don't think something particularly shady i don't see ethical issues here i don't see it as, as i said i'm just really writing stuff for other people like that's it. Um, but then you do have these shady areas. And I think it's important to flag that so people who are not doing shady stuff can say, I'm not shady. Now, in a professional context, you probably not phrase it like that. But let me let me just name two areas. Rap ghostwriting. I'm very confused about this because I have to be honest. I'm not really a rap guy. But every time I Google ghostwriting to look for podcasts, to listen to articles, whatever, I come across rap and I guess some rappers use ghostwriters to write their lyrics and the fans feel kind of like disappointed because they thought like Drake really wrote his own stuff but no there's a ghostwriter there um I I, I really have little to say about this it's just such a different field uh I'm not in the business of writing rap lyrics um but it's not that anyway like what I'm describing is a different ecosystem I, I like the term world I think it's a different world uh, I think there are worlds within writing, worlds within ghostwriting, worlds of quality, talent, whatever you want to say, just different worlds, different worlds. Academic ghostwriting, another different world. Um, 
I say that you have in ghostwriting marketplaces, clients, and ecosystems with respectively paid gigs and lots of rather make that tons of, let's just say the polar opposite. Um, okay, what is academic ghostwriting? You got people who come to you. This happened to me a few days ago. A guy doing a MBA course, and he said, "I I have a collaboration, and I I have an idea for collaboration. Collaboration cracks me up because it's just such." Ugh, what do you mean a collaborate like ghostwriting is a service a contract service right you like you go to the hairdresser you don't say like can we collaborate about this haircut like you you want know, to buy fruit can we collaborate here maybe maybe i can like you know do something and you'll give me some fruit once a week I, it's it's uh enough to end but i was just curious so it was, it was on whatsapp so he says i want to collaborate about an mba I was like, okay, so let me just get this straight. I actually thought the guy was teaching an MBA course and he needed someone to like ghostwrite for him post bigging up the course. And I was like, oh, that could be okay. That could be interesting, actually. No, he wanted, it was for, it was really weird. It was for his friend's coursework and he wanted someone to polish up the writing. Now, as soon as I figured it out, I was like, no, way, that's not something I do. That's academic ghostwriting. Academic ghostwriting is hiring ghostwriters to... Um, write coursework and to me I'm not, i wouldn't be surprised if it's illegal it's certainly um unethical because the people are being graded for this work so you're deceiving the examiner into actually thinking that the person wrote this so i have a huge beef with that i would not touch it with a barge pole but it exists and it's a shame that it, it has the same name ghostwriting because it is ghostwriting and um, because it makes people doing legit stuff look shady. So I have this terminology in my knowledge base. I also do not engage, I don't, I don't know why I read my own stuff in this weird voice, but I, I'm, I'm gonna go with it. I also do not engage in academic ghostwriting, maybe maybe because I, I'm, I'm a, I should, in a, in a previous life, I should have been a noble. I also do not engage in academic ghostwriting or any ghostwriting that aims to dissemble to a professional or certification body that my writing is that of the author. So that's the key thing to me. I wouldn't limit it to, uh, I wouldn't limit it to the academic sphere, to universities, to high schools. I would say if you're a ghostwriter, if, you know, if, if you need to pass the certification, and part of that is you need to submit an essay, I'm just, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't touched any of this stuff, so I'm just being hypothetical here. I wouldn't do that either because you're deceiving the certification body into thinking this person wrote the essay. And even if you're just, even if the content's all there and you're just polishing up the writing, I think that's still kind of scandalous. So it's a different world. That's really all I have to say about ghostwriting. Um, the weird thing is that I don't really think too much about it. Um, I, I, have look at, I have looked at Andrew Croft's books. I think it's a good resource. There are a few things to know, especially in the book world, as I said, how the publishing world works. Um, but other than that, it's really a pretty straightforward transaction, transaction, writing transaction for contract writing. So I hope that meandering um, bit of information about ghostwriting has been of some information. I'm going to embed this post into LinkedIn so that those who uh, enjoy the article can enhance their enjoyment by listening to this in the gym, on their commute, whatever is convenient. Um, so far, my experience has been uh, positive. With ghostwriting, nothing specifically negative. With freelancing, a course and writing, there's a lot of minefields, and, but those aren't specific to ghostwriting. Those are just general stuff about finding good clients to work with. And I've covered this on Medium as well. And I've covered stuff like red flags. And, you know, as I said, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be like negative and say these are the people like we shouldn't touch them and like we should fire these clients or whatever. Uh, I don't think we're in that position. We're service providers. But I do think... Um, to find the green flags, to find the good people to work with. If your pipeline is busy, you need to have a good system for eradicating the not worthwhile leads. Even if that just means freeing up hours in your day to get a proper inbound marketing funnel that'll bring you good leads, it would still be a good thing not to have to. You can only justify bad conversations as a learning curve for so long and eventually it just becomes a, a time waste basically. So that's it about ghostwriting. How can you get in touch with me? Uh, LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn is the best way. Email or pop on to dsrghostwriting.com. Fill out the form and I would be happy to return with um, any information you need. If you want a 15 minute call, click on to book a meeting and there's a 15 minute call slot. Um, and chilled out about that. You don't need to have to write, you don't need to envision an immediate need for writing. 
I ask the question just so I can prioritize internally. But if you just are interested in how it might work, projects down the line, uh, please fill that out. And it, it's basically, it's always good to have a phone call, I find. You need to get on the phone to really understand what people are doing and what their needs are. So Calendly is, a, I'm sure people know Calendly, it's a great system. And you can just book yourself a 15 minute call slot and uh, we will discuss ghostwriting and how, ghost, how the ghostwriters of ancient Rome's ancient Roman nobility and today their status in society has been diminished, but not diminished too far. So thank you. And until next time, this has been the DSR Ghostwriting Podcast.